That's an appropriate song for just about anywhere. Now, I'm going to do some hanky waving tonight, so y'all stay with me. I want you to wave yours too, all right? <laughs> Actually, I've got the sniffles, and so I'm going to be wiping a little bit because you don't want a preacher spraying you out there, right? <laughs> so, so you pray for me that I don't sniffle on you. I noticed the front rows kind of moved back a little bit already, so you're safe. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 17 tonight. 1 Samuel and chapter number 17, one of the most familiar passages of Scripture. We learn it when we're children in Sunday school. Story of David and how he killed a giant. Sometimes we preachers shy away from very familiar passages of Scripture because we're afraid everybody's already heard that. They'll think I'm preaching a rerun. Well, that's all I preach anyway. Until Charles Spurgeon writes some new sermons, I won't have any new ones. <laughs> oh, actually, it's... The sermon from this morning was an original, I, I'll tell you that. It, I, uh, I labored over that because I had a, a very tender heart towards that passage of Scripture. And I have, a, I have a, an affinity with this passage too, and maybe we'll see a fresh approach to this passage tonight in 1 Samuel chapter number 17, <coughs> and we'll, uh, we'll go down to, uh, let's see, Let's go down to verse number, oh, shucks, it's a long passage. Let me, uh, let me see where the best place for me to start is. I want to have some preaching time. Don't tie it all up in just reading. All right, let's start in verse number 32. 1 Samuel 17, verse number 32. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight. With this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he, a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and I smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. When I, <laughs> and when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Now in verse 36, I, I'd like to just suggest something there. As far as Goliath is concerned... He didn't, he didn't die over there when David hit him with the rock in the forehead. He didn't die when David chopped his head off of the sword. He died right here. He died in verse number 36 because David said, I'm going to kill him. God's going to see to it. <laughs> and so he's as good as dead. All David's got to do after he chops Saul's head off, all he's got to do at that point is just put some flowers on the grave. It's done. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Verse number 37, David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail, David girded his sword upon his armor and he essayed to go for he had not proved it. In other words, he, David saying, I haven't tried this out. I'm used to a sling and some rocks. I hadn't used the stuff like this armor and your sword and helmet and things like that. I don't know anything about that, but I know slingshots. <laughs> And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, I have not, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And David took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near to David. And <laughs> the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked, at, uh, looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy, 
of a fair countenance. In other words, he didn't have all the scars and the wrinkles and the, and the beaten look of a seasoned soldier. He looked like a boy. Verse 43, and, and the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with sword and, and with spear and with shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord. Now there's his strength right there. The Lord of hosts, the, house, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand. And I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give thee, give the carcasses, the host of the Philistines. This day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now I'm going to stop reading there for the sake of time, and you know the rest of the story, how they went out and faced each other in the valley. David took his slingshot and a stone and put it right square between his eyes, and down went the giant. And sure enough, the Lord did win the victory that day. <clears throat> Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless us. Father, <clears throat> I pray that you'd help us tonight to have strength and encouragement for the giants we face. Lord, I understand that this is a literal battle with a, with a literal giant, but yet through your strength, David slew that giant. Now I pray that the things that look like giants in our lives would suddenly become smaller because we know that thou hast the power to fight our battles for us. Bless us tonight. Lord, help us to understand just how to call upon you and to depend upon you in faith that you might win our battles over the giants. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Winning over the giants. Winning over the giants. I can testify that I've had a few giants in my life. You have too. In 1982, I surrendered to preach. Well, I was actually surrendered in 81. <clears throat> Lord, had, I sensed the Lord calling me to preach, and so I surrendered publicly, came down to an altar, and, and told the preacher, I believe God's calling me to preach. And so he stood me up before the congregation and said, uh, the Lord's called Rick to preach. And so uh, I think they were all surprised and maybe a little bit disheartened by it. <laughs> but but uh, nevertheless, I think God called me to preach that day, and so I began to seek counsel. And, and uh, before too long, I decided on a route to follow, and that route was to go off to Bible college and prepare for the ministry. I didn't know much about the Bible, but I knew that I needed to be prepared. And so loaded up my wife and the kids and our furniture, put it in a U-Haul truck and headed to Oklahoma City to go to Bible college. Didn't know anybody out there, didn't have a place to live, didn't have a job to work, but by faith we went. And when we got there, we had to scrounge around and, and uh, finally found a house. And after a couple of weeks, uh, living off what little bit we'd saved up to... Uh, look for a job, finally found a job and, <clears throat> and was able to uh, make a living, squeaking by, paying for my tuition at college, paying for three kids going to the Christian school and then buying groceries and all the other payments that you have in life. And so <clears throat> on top of all that, <clears throat> I was working at night, and enrolled in Bible college in the daytime, going to school from eight in the morning until about one o'clock in the afternoon, run home, Get on my work clothes, head out to the job where we were trimming out houses, building cabinets and stuff. Go out there and work until one or two in the morning and then drive home. And then study and read for an hour or two, try to get some assignments done. And just looking for maybe three or four hours sleep. And then get up, get the kids in the car, get them to the Christian school. And I'd go to the college class, go to classes. Staying awake was a struggle and uh, going to church on Sunday. Man, I love preaching. I love preaching whether it's me doing it or whether it's somebody else doing it. As long as it's coming from the Bible, I like it. But I, I'll tell you, for the first time in my life, I, I felt like a dirty, low-down dog. I was sitting there in church services at night, 
and I had my Bible open. I'm trying to follow the preacher, and the first thing I know, my head's going down. I felt terrible. All I could do was want to sleep. Man, working all, nearly all night, going to school all day, very little time for, for family. Actually, it was non-existent. And then on Sunday morning, or Saturday morning, we'd get up and go on bus visitation. We had to go to bus breakfast about, I think it was around 7.30 or 8 o'clock, had to be at bus breakfast, and a whole bunch of us would eat breakfast together there at the church, and then we'd go out and visit on bus route till about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and then we had just about three or four hours of family time that night, and part of that time had to be spent doing uh, preparing for Sunday school class I was teaching. And then the next morning we'd get up early again, go get out about daylight to the church, get on the get on a bus and head out for the bus routes. And I'm talking about we had a long route and we'd have like 60 or 80 kids on the bus and we'd have a program on the bus and we had to tell Bible stories and preach and sing and, and we had a full program. And by the time we got back to church, we had to walk all the kids to the Sunday school class, then hurry over to, to our class and then we'd get back in the auditorium for preaching and then, then we had to get on the bus and go all the way home. We'd get back home maybe 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon again and, and have about an hour to an hour and a half to grab something to eat and rest before we went back to church. We had a preacher's meeting at church. All the preachers in the college met at 5 o'clock. We had a preacher's meeting where they preached to the preachers. And then at 6 o'clock they had training union. Anybody familiar with that? Training union. They used to have it in a lot of churches back then. And so you had training union at 6 o'clock and the vice president of the college would preach for an hour then. And then at 7 o'clock Brother Vineyard would preach. And I don't think he ever got a message in an hour. He preached a long time, and boy, by the time that night was done, I was done, and get up the next day on Monday morning and start it all over again. Well, by 1984, I was tired. I had one year left to go to graduate and get my four-year degree, and one year out during that summer, I just decided I'd had all I could take. I was so tired. I felt backslidden. No time to read my Bible really very much and have a spiritual time with the Lord. I'm just going, 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 doing stuff all the time. And I just wanted some relief. And so I got an offer from Arkansas to come back and be principal of a Christian school. And I told the pastor, I said, I'm still a year out from graduating. He said, well, you, you can stay there and graduate if, if you want to and and uh, he said, I just need somebody right now. And I didn't, he said, I didn't know whether you might want to come home and do that or not. And so, man, I was wanting some rest and relief. I said, I'll do it. <laughs> I got to get out of here. Man, I'm dying. Well, in a couple of months, I figured out I jumped out of the frying pan into the fire. Man, it, it wasn't any easier. Everything was hard. The days were long and had to work for a living and minister just like I did at Bible College. And... When I got ready to leave Oklahoma City coming back here, I let a couple of guys that friends with me know that I was going to drop out of college and come back to Arkansas. Well, word got back to Brother Vineyard and Brother Foster and some of the administration that I was about to quit. And from that day forward to the day I left, it was a couple of weeks before we could leave there, and it seemed like every message had my name on it. This wasn't imagination. I mean, it was everything but calling my name. They were a very austere place in those days, and quitters were looked at as though they had leprosy, and you were written off as a backslider and a sinner, and you're probably going to hell. <laughs> Maybe, almost that bad. <laughs> Traitor. And <clears throat> they got wind of it, and so, man, I was getting preached to in chapel, preached to in every service. Uh, quitter, 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 quitter. Man, you talk about a, a giant. I was facing the giant of being tired and miserable and wanting some rest, and so went back to Arkansas. But the giant then wouldn't leave me alone. I ran from that giant, and then when I got back in Arkansas, then after a while I began to say, you know, I should have stayed there and finished up. I could have done it. I could have done it. I could have gritted my teeth and done it somehow. And from that day on, I began to wish that I'd stayed put. And so I sought for several years a way to get back and finish that last year. Well, finally, <coughs> the opportunity came, and I said, look, it's to myself, this is going to be a battle. When I go back, everybody out there hates my guts now because I left the first time, but I'm going back, and I'm going to finish. I don't care if I have to fist fight Brother Vineyard, and that would be worse than wrestling an alligator. 
<coughs> I'm going back and I'm going to finish. He's not going to keep me from doing it. Brother Foster is not going to keep me from doing it. The other students who think I've been a turncoat, they're not going to keep me from doing it. I'm facing this giant and I'm going to finish. I'm going to graduate. And <coughs> when I got there, Brother Vineyard and all of them, they, were, they treated me nice. See, a lot of the stuff I created up here, but he treated me good. In fact, I went to him just to make sure I was going to face my giant, the giant of being able to stick it out and finish. You know what I'm talking about? Being able to stick something out and finish. I enrolled. I needed that fourth year, and that was my giant. And I said, I'm going to stick it out. If the devil himself comes up and faces me, I'm going to fight him. And so I went to Brother Vineyard, and I, I became very... Very good friends with Brother Vineyard. I said, look, I'd like, I'm selling insurance now, and so I can control my own, uh, my own schedule. And I know you go to a lot of, you're preaching at a lot of mission conferences and revivals and stuff. I know you'd like to have a driver with you when you're driving back late at night. I'd like to be that guy and go with you. And so he said, well, that'd be great. And so I went with him and drove him back and forth to mission conferences for months and months. And the battle by the power of the Lord and faith that God could do it was won. That giant fell, and I got to walk across the platform and get my diploma. And I'm just telling you that you may have giants in your life. Your giants may be different than mine. Your giant may be sin. Your giant may be getting control on finances. Your giant may be an uncontrolled family. Your giant may be a number of things, but I'm here to tell you that the power of God is, it is available through faith and he can deliver you from the mouth of the lion and from the mouth of the bear, and he can deliver you from your giant. Let's look at a few things together tonight from this passage of Scripture that I think will be a, a help. I want to be an encouragement to you, <coughs> and I think this will, will be a, an encouragement to you. You can take off a few heads yourself. <laughs> I heard one sermon preached by Ron Garris one thing one time, and it wasn't this passage of Scripture, it was another one. And uh, the title of his sermon was Head Busting Runs in My Family. <laughs> so you can bust a few heads yourself. <clears throat> this, the children of Israel had been in Egypt. They got led out by Moses and they were going to the promised land. They got to Kadesh Barnea. They were just ready to cross in there and within two years from time leaving Egypt, they were there at the threshold of the promised land. But they went over into the promised land <coughs> or sent some spies over there <coughs> and said, see if we believe we can take it. Spies came back and said, no, we can't take it. There are giants over there. They wandered for 38 more years because God said, all right, if you're not going to do as I said, then we're going to let you wander out here until your carcasses fall, until the kids grow up and then they can cross into the promised land. <coughs> so after 32, 38 years, they come back and they still have to face those giants. The giants are still there. The giants are still there. And your giants will always be there till you face them like David did this day. The giants won't go away. You may be facing some giants tonight and you need a little encouragement about it. I'm going to tell you how to be a giant killer tonight. All right, number one, how do we... How do we get the victory over our giant? Number one, exhibit the right motives. <clears throat> exhibit the right motives. When you go back to the earlier verses here and David shows up, he's supposed to be there and take some, take some food for the army. The army's been out there and the Philistines have been defying the armies of Israel day after day, day after day, 40 mornings and 40 evenings. The Philistine comes out, the giant comes out and says, send me out a man and we'll do battle. If we win, you'll be our servants. If you win, we'll be your servants. And for 40 days that goes on. David shows up and he starts asking questions. And his brother said, I know the naughtiness of your heart. You want to be here. You want to be seen. You want to try to be somebody. And they questioned his motives. They said, you're just a little sheep, sheep herder. You can't do anything. You're just, trying to, you're just trying to make a wave here and you're not going to do it. Well, David was little and he wasn't a seasoned warrior, but he had had some victories in his life. 
He's facing that giant. The giant that comes out there. David hears the giant. The giant. This giant is no ordinary soldier. The giant of the Philistines, he's a guy that's 10 feet tall. He's a guy that has on armor that weighs 175 pounds. <laughs> that's as much as I weigh. And he's carrying armor that weighs that much. He's got a spear that's 35 pounds. And he's got a big sword. Huge. This is no ordinary soldier. This guy is defying Israel. And Israel is shaking in their boots. David says, we can't have this. He can't talk to the Lord's people that way. These are the people of God. When David spoke of killing the giants, his, most, his motives were questioned. You know, there, <clears throat> in verse 25 and 27 <clears throat> and 30, <clears throat> there were some promises made that the man who could, who could fight and win against Goliath, Saul had made some promises. Hey, you can have, you can have some money, give you a lot of money, give you him, give him my daughter. And so there were some rewards offered, but that's not what motivated David. But they question these motives. Sometimes a preacher of the word of the Lord will have his motives questioned. He's just in it for the money. <laughs> Independent Baptist preachers in it for the money. <laughs> I would have chose, I would have chose Southern Baptist Convention. Yeah, I've got a retirement plan. <laughs> in for the money? No. I'm not in it for the income, I'm in it for the outcome. David's mo motives were not promoting himself. So what were his motives? Well, was it a stepping stone to the throne? After all, Samuel had anointed him previously to be the new king of Israel. But no, that wasn't it. God's going to provide that anyway. His heart, I believe, was motivated by two things. Number one, the glory of God. Look in verse number 26 in our text. In verse number 26, it says, And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the men that killeth the Philistine and taketh away the reproach, see that, the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David is not offended for himself. David is offended because these Philistines are tearing down the name of God and God's people. David said, I want to bring glory to the name of the Lord. And so his motive was good. In verse 29 and 36, you can see that the Philistines mocking God. David said, I'm sick of it. I'm, I've only been here for a little while. I ain't been here 40 days yet, but everybody ought to be sick of this where people are mocking God. I think a second reason, not was just, it was to bring glory to God, but I think a second motive was that he wanted to fulfill his role as the newly anointed king. Now, he knew he wasn't king yet, but being anointed meant, meant that like he took care of this flock of sheep, he would be expected to take care of Israel. And he's saying, these Philistines are not going to do that to my Israel. There's going to be a fight. <coughs> he would protect Israel from the attack of Goliath. When you see the giants you're facing in your own life, you need to ask the question, why do, I want to, why do I want to defeat this giant? Is it to make me look better? Is it because I'm embarrassed? Because of my friends? Is it for money? Is it for gain? Or is it to bring glory to God? I think when we're, when we're facing giants, if we want to destroy a giant that's in our lives, I think we have to explore what our motives really are and make sure we've got a pure motive. I want to bring honor and glory to the Lord by doing away with this giant. Or number two, or maybe both this and number two, is a desire for God's plan to be fulfilled in your own life. If there's a joint, if there's a giant keeping you from fulfilling God's will in your life, then destroying that giant becomes a very good objective and a pure motive. Sometimes... Doing God's will may not be something we want to do. <laughs> and we ignore the giant because we're not wanting to do God's will anyway. You know, sometimes God's, God's, will comes with some, God's will comes with some difficulty at times. Isn't that true? 
a little funny story I heard about the two 90-year-old women, Bertha and Betty. Bertha was on her deathbed, and Betty went to see her. <coughs> and uh, Bertha told Betty, said, or Betty told Bertha, Bertha was going to die. And Betty told Bertha, she said, looks like you're going to be going to heaven soon. She said, I want you to do me a favor when you get to heaven. And Bertha said, what's that? We've been friends all of our life. I'd, I'd do about anything for you. What do you want me to do? And Betty said, well, when you get there, Bertha, when you get to heaven, somehow, some way, I'd like for you to find a way to contact me and let me know if they have women's softball there. We've always loved softball. <laughs> and I want to know if there's women's softball in heaven. Bertha said, if there's any way that I can do that, I'll do it for you. Well, Bertha passed away. <coughs> a, few, a few days after the funeral, she's laying in bed at night, and a voice wakes her up in the middle of the night. Betty, Betty. And she said, who is it? She said, it's Bertha. She said, you're not Bertha. Bertha died. She said, no, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm Bertha. I told you I'd let you know about the conditions in heaven. It's really Bertha. She said, oh, well, what would you find out? She said, well, I found out that heaven is a wonderful place. It's beautiful. Man, it never snows, never rains. And, they, and, and, and I've got good news and bad news. She said, the good news is they do have women's softball. And we can play every day. The weather don't ever interrupt it. And, man, it's just beautiful. The temperature is great. And we're all, we're all young again in heaven. And she said, it's just great. We've been playing bas ba uh, uh, softball every day. And Betty said, well, that is good news. So what's the bad news? Betty, Bertha said, well, the bad news is you're pitching next Tuesday. <laughs> the will of God doesn't always appeal to us, but the will of God is the will of God. David had the right motives for wanting to conquer that giant. Number two, not only do we need to have the right motives, but we need to embrace the right methods. When David's plan to kill the giant reached the ears of King Saul, there were a chorus of naysayers saying, you can't do it. And David <clears throat> was not... He was not put off by it. He'd made up his mind. He's going to do it. And in verse 38, Saul's going to give David his armor. He's given him all this heavy armor. David's never done any of that. He's not proved that on his own body. He's not been in a conflict wearing that kind of gear. He's not used to being weighted down. He's used to having a slingshot. And so the right method is to do, David's, David's method was, I know what God did with that bear, and I know what God did with that lion, but I have no idea what we're going to do with this coat of mail, armor. I'm not sure about that. I want to stick with the ways that's been tried and proven with God. You see, there's always, there's always new fads. You can go to every seminar and you can listen to every church growth guru and you can listen to everybody that tells you how to do ministry. But the things that have worked, the principles that have worked for eons of time are the proven and tried methods. The principles that have worked ought to be the ones that you and I were. What do we do? Well, we can pray. That's always worked. We can use the word of God. That's always worked. And we can have faith. That's always worked. Faith is unstoppable. When you've got faith in God, God has no limits to his power. He is not only omniscient, he is omnipotent, meaning he can do anything and he's all powerful and that giant of the Philistines cannot stand against the Lord. And David said, my faith is in God. And when you've got a giant in your own life, <clears throat> no matter what it is, when you put your faith in God and in his promises, in God and his promises. Faith. And you can be unstoppable too. What God did back then, you know what it says about God in Hebrews, right? The same yesterday, today, and forever. The same God has not lost his strength. The same God can give through faith, our faith in him, he can give us the same kind of victories over our giants. Whatever giant you're facing, God doesn't change. 
Well, he took his staff. David took his staff and picked up five smooth stones. And There's some theories about why he took five. The Bible doesn't say, so I'm not sure it's worth speculating on. <laughs> some say, well, he picked up five stones because five is the number of grace and David needed God's grace. Well, I doubt if, God, I doubt if David knew that much about numerology. <laughs> some say, well, Goliath had four sons. And so David picked up one stone for Goliath and one for each one of the sons. I'm not sure David knew that Goliath had four sons at this time either. I think the most likely reason is David won't be able to finish his job. He picked up five smooth stones because in case that first one didn't take David, take the, the, the giant Goliath down, he had a reload. And he wanted to finish the job. And that's what I think. And again, the Bible doesn't say. <clears throat> but when you've got a giant in your life, five smooth stones may mean that you just need to keep swinging till the giant goes down. Don't give up. Keep swinging. He's a giant and he won't fall easy. But you've got some backup stones. By faith, you'll just keep on swinging. What is that giant in your life right now? What are you looking at that you can't quite get over? Well... You can try just about any method you want to try, but faith seems to be the very best. Faith in God. God is greater than your giants. And whatever worked for David will still work now. Third place, you start with the right motives, use the right methods, and the third place, expect the right miracles. David walked down that valley that day. <laughs> He's heard the giant up there yelling and cussing the people of Israel. For 40 days, and nobody's tried to challenge the giant yet. And then here's little scrawny David with a slingshot and five rocks. And he walks down that hillside to meet Goliath in an impossible situation. <laughs> impossible if there's no God. <laughs> I think God kind of likes impossible situations, you know. He went down there and he was doubted by some. He was ridiculed by some and he was ridiculed by the giant. And he goes down there and the giant says, you're coming out to me like this? You got a stick and a slingshot? I'm going to feed you to the buzzards, boy. <laughs> David said, no, you've got it wrong. I've already talked to God about this and you're the one that's going to be the buzzard bait. When this is all over, you're going down. And there was a face-off. Well, did he win the victory? He did. David won the victory. How did he do it? Through faith. Mr. Worrywart had thought for years he couldn't afford to tithe to his local church. He had bills to pay and his income wasn't that good. And his wife, Panicky Polly, she warned her husband and said, we can't afford to tithe. We've got, to, we've got bills to pay and if we go on that kind of a rabbit trail, we'll... We'll be in worse shape financially than we've ever been. It won't work for us. And then they got to talking to a faithful brother at their church, old faithful Frank. And faithful Frank said, I, I was in a place such as then, and I didn't have faith that God could take care of me if I started tithing. I'd probably go broke and never be able to get out. And he said, but I decided to face that giant one day, and I went down into the valley with nothing but faith in God. And I decided to face that giant and start tithing, help out my local church. Well, he said, I went down in the valley of trembling, with nothing but the promises of God, that God would take care of me. And he said, I want you to know that that giant of despair that day, the one that had talked me out and had scorned me, I decided to win over him through faith. And God slew that giant. I began to tithe and God's taken care of me ever since. And so he told... <coughs> He told Polly, panicky Polly, and, uh, and about her husband, Mr. Worrywart, and they decided to themselves become giant killers. And they began to face their giants, and they did win, and now they're on the winning side with faithful Frank. Slaying giants had become their favorite pastime. Hey, when, you, when God takes somebody down, when God takes down your giant, you're not near as afraid of the next giant. Someone here tonight might need that encouragement. 
just to be able to face those giants. You may not see your giants fall as quickly as David did, but they'll fall. I think where the devil gets the victory so many times, we think when we exercise faith that God has to work on our plan, our schedule, and that giant has to fall immediately the same day. You may have some giants that are tough. <laughs> Would you say that maybe the Philistine looked pretty tough? He's 10 foot tall. After David took him down with that smooth stone between the eyes, how tall was he then? That 10 foot tall giant was now 10 feet long. <laughs> and you can crawl over a giant that height, <laughs> yeah, can't you? God may not erase your giant. That giant still existed after David killed him, but he's laying down where David can get over him now. And God will take your giants through faith, and he'll stretch them out where you can get past them. And eventually he might just decide to eliminate them. But remember with the Apostle Paul, he said, I, thought, I sought the Lord three times for that thorn in the flesh. God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. And so what did God do? He didn't completely eliminate Paul's giant, but he did knock that giant down. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. He gave enough grace to the apostle Paul that he could crawl over that giant that was laying on his back and get on the other side. You may have a giant that will jump up in front of you again every once in a while, but you can keep crawling over him if God's laid him in the dust. I'm going to ask you a question right now. Was that giant still there after David slew him? He was still there. David took his head and he took his sword some of the belongings that that giant had as memorabilia. <laughs> you know why we need to remember the things? You know what, what David did every morning when he'd wake up, he'd see that, he'd so, see those articles that he took off of the giant. He'd see those things that every morning when he woke up and he'd say, well, there's a giant God took care of for me. I believe he can do it again. And so don't ever forget about the giants that God has slain in your past. We need to have mental reminders of what God has done. That's one of the things we do on Thanksgiving. We're thinking about mentally what God has done for us in the past. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. It will surprise you what the Lord has done. And as we remember those things that he's done, we'll have more faith to believe that he can do it again. You might need to get out of debt. You might need to get over a disease. You might need to have something done in your family. <clears throat> it looks like a giant. Can God do it? If he can kill the Philistine giant, he can kill your giant too. Let's pray. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you that you've given us this example in the Old Testament of how David, through faith, was able to depend upon you to slay his giant. Lord, we can win over our giants too if we'll just trust you and I pray that that's exactly what would happen in our hearts tonight that we'd increase our faith that you'd help us to just believe that you can do it and Lord that we'd see our giants fall and we can get past them and serve you with a joyful heart bless us tonight during this invitation time we pray in Jesus name amen if you'd stand together with me with our heads bowed and eyes closed as she plays I invite you to come